The freedom message draws the person to deliverance ministry indirectly. Eternal burn, of course, doesn't do anything like that. Uh, so when a person receives the freedom message, um, they're being told that they can escape the bad and come into the good. When they first repent, a lot of that will happen, but they'll be sanctified over time and um, they'll be looking to find the the method of getting greater sanctification more quickly. And deliverance ministry is one um, one thing that they'll be using to get that sanctification. The freedom message is one which non-Christians might tell others in need about. Um, so an example of this might be that, um, say, you give the freedom message to someone that's a non-Christian and they're not interested in it, but a, a week later, or even a year later, could be 10 years later, their neighbour has a drug addiction and they're chatting to their neighbour and their neighbour with the drug addiction is so desperate to overcome this drug addiction, they're talking about how it's ruined their life and how they wish they could just put it behind them. And then out of nowhere, God decides to use this person that has heard the freedom message and say, oh, well, if you're that desperate, why don't you pray to Jesus? I've heard Jesus sets people free from drug addictions and bad moods and things. Here, I've got this card in my drawer that I got years ago. I'll give it to you. So now you've got a non-Christian spreading the gospel. That would not happen with the eternal burn message. Non-Christians will never spread eternal burn to other people. So with the freedom message, it might end up that you'll have non-Christians doing your work for you, your work being to spread the gospel. Um, the freedom message is less likely to be thrown into the bin. So look, no one's going to hold on to a little um, sheet of paper that's telling them they're going to hell for being addicted to drugs and having lust in their life. I doubt it anyway. I, I don't see a reason why they would do that unless they believe in it. If they don't, it'll just go straight in the bin. But the freedom message is something that, although they might not want at that point in time, they they see it's, it's empowering. So they might just stow it away with their other business cards. I put these things on, these designs on business cards, by the way. Um, and I can email them to anyone that's interested if you want to send me a message in the comments section I'll email you um, the files and you can send them off to Vistaprint that's the company that I've been using and um, yeah it's pretty cheap it works out to kind of less than 10 cents per card if you buy say a thousand or more um, yeah so um, God might get it put into a um, into a drawer and he might have it be found by the person years later at just the right time. And again, it might not even be for the person finding it. It might be for a friend or family member of the person. You know, it's it's something that's less likely to be thrown into the bin anyway. The freedom message explains Christianity. Turn or burn is an incomplete explanation of Christianity. As I mentioned in a previous reason, Without the freedom message accompanying it, turn or burn is a false doctrine. It's um, It comes across as illogical, and it is a false doctrine. You need to tell them that Christians are no better than them. Christians have just been set free, and they can be set free too. The freedom message uses everyday language and makes the gospel accessible, practical, simple, and attractive and empowering and also relevant. Uh, the turn or burn message is confusing to people that are in bondage to sin because they do not understand why God would hate them when they did not even choose to be addicted to sin. You know, I don't know if you've noticed, but almost all sin is, well, I don't know if addicted is a word we can apply to all sin, but a lot of sin seems to be addictive it's it's certainly compulsive you've got well drug use can be addictive lust it's not addictive but it's a compulsion it's you could liken it to an addiction 
and gluttony is a compulsion. You find people that can't stop lying. You find people that are taken over by bad moods. They're not addicted to bad moods, but the bad moods have taken them over, you know? Enslaved is a more accurate word for it. Um, so, yeah, God does not even hate them anyway. So it's evil to tell them that. It's evil to tell them that God hates them. Um, yeah. The, the freedom message is 100% absolute truth. Eternal burn only tells part of the truth and it leaves out the best part of the gospel. Eternal burn should be preached too, though. So yeah, I will continue to remind you throughout. I'm not saying that eternal burn should not be preached. I'm just saying that um, there's a better option to have as the spearhead of your evangelizing efforts. Um, yeah, eternal burn can't be taken as part truth. It's um, It can't lead to confusion. It can't be misused by the devil. The freedom message allows the gospel to sell itself. The eternal burn message is unappealing and illogical to the non-believer. And most importantly, it can't be believed by the non-believers. So, like I mentioned, it's like they forget that God is the one who saves people. They kind of imply that people remain damned because they haven't run into a preacher such as themselves. Um, they, they almost imply that their efforts are going to get someone saved. But um, it's God that saves people. It's our message. It's our job to deliver the message. And if they've already heard Turn or Burn and they haven't heard the other message, then you're not really doing your job in spreading the gospel, are you? The freedom message complements and completes the Turn or Burn message. Uh, without the freedom message, the Turn or Burn message is incomplete. God can use the freedom message to bring people that need to hear it to those who have heard it and causing and by causing the topic to come up in conversation. Thus, God can spread the freedom message further. So for every tract you hand out, God can use that to a greater um, extent to further his kingdom than he can for one tract of the heaven and hell message, the eternal burn message. Now, I would liken the freedom message to something like this. Um, you know how spreading the gospel is, um, Jesus used the analogy of um, spreading the seed. Um, some seed blows in the wind, other seed gets stuck in the fur of animals. I would liken the freedom message to one of those seeds that gets stuck in the fur of an animal because you'll get that message into the side of a person that might be destined to die and go to hell. But God might use that person to drop that seed off to someone else. Like I mentioned earlier with the neighbor potentially talking to his drug addicted neighbor that needs to hear the message, God can pull that seed out of the person's fur and plonk it in the other person. But it's less likely to occur that way with the eternal burn message. The eternal burn message doesn't have that same potential to be spread in that way. Uh, the freedom message is less offensive, so you can go places with it that you cannot go with the eternal burn message. So look, whether it's offensive or not is not really relevant because we're just called to be hated for Jesus' name anyway. But it's a fact that there's certain places you can't go and spread the turn or burn message because you'll get kicked out for being disruptive. But with the um, freedom message, there's possibly less restrictions. Um, you, can, you can certainly be less disruptive with the freedom message than with the um, turn or burn message. The devil is indoctrinating the youth with acceptance of pedophilia and homosexuality 
and this will be used in the future to generate hatred towards the church. Now, I've seen this recently with the um, education that's going on. It's coming from the UN. And I see this as the devil's scheme to eventually turn the masses against the church, painting the church as the great oppressive force which encourages people to feel ashamed of themselves. So look, in the future, what I'm telling you will become more relevant because the devil is counting on us, preaching the turn of turn or burn message and offending these people that have had homosexuality and pedophilia normalized and more or less playing into his scheme um, to generate hatred towards the church. But if, it, if we're instead preaching the freedom message, then his scheme will not be as effective as he perhaps thought it would be. Look, the devil, he's got some schemes and we want to stay ahead of the game. The turn or burn message does nothing to avoid playing into the devil's scheme of painting the church as unreasonable and mean. So look, the devil will be doing that in the future. I'd say he's already doing it to a large extent and he will certainly be doing it in the future. The freedom message corrects the lie given to the youth by the devil and cannot be misused by the devil, unlike the turn or burn message. Okay, so I hope that point's worded well enough for you to um, get what I was trying to put forward. Um, yeah, the devil is going to try and paint the church as full of hypocrisy and he's going to paint the church as a, um, as being unreasonable and irrelevant and something that society can do without. But when you go and tell them that Jesus sets people free from sin, well, that reminds them that, um, there's a, there's a great relevance to the church. Uh, so yeah, I guess a good word to include in this last point would have been relevance. The devil will try and paint the church as being irrelevant and pointless, but the freedom message brings new relevance to the, um, to the church in general. Even if the person doesn't want to, um, take the, take the opportunity to um, be set free from sin, they can at least see that it's put forward on that card, that it, that it has this relevance to at least some people. Uh, so in summary, efforts and resources put into spreading the freedom message go further, have less potential to harm, can be used more by God, and have more potential to undo the devil's lies and schemes. So that's important there, that it has less potential to harm. I think it has no potential to harm the kingdom of God, and it has no potential to aid the devil's kingdom. The turn or burn message, when preached without the freedom message, can potentially be used by the devil to create lies and disdain towards the church, to make Christianity seem illogical and a doctrine which lacks evidence and it cannot be used by God as much as the freedom message can. Um, but look, both messages should be preached. The freedom message can be preached without the turn or burn message because everyone has heard the turn or burn message. That's a generalisation. Perhaps not every single person in Western civilization has heard it but we can, um, we can generalise and say pretty much everyone has heard it. The turn or burn message should never be preached without the freedom message because to do so is a false doctrine of hypocrisy and a false doctrine of unjust condemnation. But, um, yeah, if you've got a hell testimony, by all means share that. But just preaching that heaven and hell are real because you read it in a book, that's not really painting Christianity as logical or reasonable or anything that deserves any kind of investigation by a non-believer. You have to understand 
if the devil sees that a Christian is going out and that they are committed to preaching on the street, then the devil's agenda is to make that effort destructive to the kingdom of God and beneficial to the kingdom of darkness. So how would um, yelling about turn or burn towards people and being argumentative and unreasonable and arrogant be beneficial to the kingdom of darkness? Well, it would benefit them in this way. The, the non-believer walks past and there's demons hanging around that non-believer ministering hatred towards the church as a result of having heard that demon preaching through the Christian. So, um, and those demons will follow those non-believers home and if they get a bit of a hook in them, they'll continue to minister to them until they've they've fired them up so angrily and ter- they might even turn them into like really keen militant atheists and it might drive them on and fuel them into the future to rail against the church. Because look, I'm a Christian and I'm watching them and, and they're annoying me. Imagine what they do to non-believers. So, um, and of course, they're preaching. I, I don't know how it's um, benefiting the kingdom of God because look, everyone's already heard the message. And um, reminding someone of something generally doesn't change their beliefs. Like, when you're preaching turn or burn, you're generally not presenting any new evidence. You're just pre- presenting your belief and no real reason to believe in it. Um, I haven't heard any of the turn or burn preachers suggest that people should investigate the matter by looking at hell testimonies. I'm sure that occurs. But yeah, so what I was saying there on the end was that I believe that many of the turn or burn preachers are naive to the fact that the devil will be seeking to influence their preaching. And um, I hope some of this logic I've put forward um, gives you reason to question as to whether the turn or burn message should be the message that you use as the spearhead. Because look, I think it um, it falls short of being the best message. Obviously, the freedom from the enslavement of sin message is more empowering and it's more interesting, it's more acceptable, it's more relevant, it's more practical, it's, it promotes Christianity as being based on um, claims that are testable and it encourages the person to engage with Jesus Christ. Um, but yeah, again, turn or burn. There's nothing wrong with turn or burn. I just don't think it should be uh, preached as often at it, as it is as the as the spearhead of a person's evangelizing efforts. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, I guess that's about all I have to say on that matter for now. Just trying to think. It's a topic I could talk about for a long time. Um, I kind of want to talk about it more. Um, Yeah, look, the potential for it to bring about conversations about testimony, it really keeps any conversation about Christianity in a humble, selfless place. Um the non-Christian would feel comfortable coming up and talking about how their friend became a Christian and how they themselves don't really know about it and how they're interested to find out how it all works. They might come up and say, yeah, my friend on Facebook, he, he was into heavy metal and drugs and perversions and stuff and then all of a sudden he was a Christian. I don't know what happened to him. How, how does it work? The individual might feel more comfortable coming up to someone preaching Jesus sets people free from sin, then he would feel comfortable coming up to a person that's preaching turn or burn. You know, and if they did come up and try to engage with the turn or burn preacher, they'd probably get told off and they'd they'd get the wrong intention, uh, the wrong impression 
of their friend. They might come to believe that their friend on Facebook is one of these rude hypocrites like the Eternal Burn preachers. They might come to think, they might come to have false beliefs about their friend as a result of having run into the Eternal Burn preaching hypocrite. Not that all of them are hypocrites, but there's some of them that are that are not without hypocrisy. And I'm not without hypocrisy. We're all less than perfect. And um, we're being sanctified. But um, of course, true Christians are not in willful sin. But I think First John chapter 1 verse 8 shows that all Christians should be finding accidental sin on, in themselves on a continuing basis and getting cleansed of it as per First John chapter 1 verse 9, which says, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But um, I think a lot of, well, the eternal burn preachers certainly come across as if they think that they're more righteous than those who they are preaching to, and they certainly take credit for their righteousness. Now, if you're interested in finding out about how you are not responsible, well, about how a Christian is really being a hypocrite if they're taking credit for their righteousness. I have a video called Five Ways Which God Uses to Make Us Righteous. See, it's only by God's intervention that any Christian was ever made righteous. And for these eternal burn preachers to imply that other people should be ashamed of themselves and that they themselves have something to be proud of, uh, that, that's missing the mark. And I know that a lot of them don't mean to do that, but they kind of fall in that direction sometimes. And it's something we all have to keep an eye on for ourselves. And um, yeah, I, look, in Australia, we don't have that culture. I've never seen someone teaching turn or burn on the streets. Well, actually, I have on a video. But um, in America, I guess you guys are more densely populated. So it's not necessarily that you guys even have more of it per capita it's just that you guys have more areas but i've i've seen on the internet your preaching culture in america is um yeah it's full of turn or burn and um i think there's a potential to um kind of wean out some of the devil's influence in there and to um refine it into a more effective um message and yeah, I think there's a lot of gains to be made there anyway.